cartilaginous fish are considered to have evolved from acanthodians. By the start of the early Devonian, 419 million years ago, jawed fishes had divided into three distinct groups, the now extinct placoderms, the bony fishes, and the clade that includes spiny sharks and early cartilaginous fish. Their skeleton is cartilaginous. The notochord is gradually replaced by a vertebral column during development, except in holocephali, where the notochord stays intact. In some deepwater sharks, the column is reduced. Harpagophyter was a distant relative of modern chimeras, and lived during the early Carboniferous in the shallow tropical sea that formed the Bear Gulch limestone deposits in Montana. While all specimens show an elongated eel-like body, they come in two different forms, one with a fairly normal skull, and one with a pair of huge jointed cartilaginous appendages in front of its eyes that resemble antennae or antlers. The presence of large claspers on the antlered forms indicated they were males, with the weird appendages probably being used either for display or as grappling hooks to hang on to females during mating. Growing to around 70 centimeters in length, Balancia had an odd sort of leaf-shaped body and large veil-like fins, which would have made it a very maneuverable swimmer but also relatively slow. Its large bluntly serrated teeth formed a beak-like arrangement, allowing it to graze on encrusting animals such as sponges and crinoids. Only a few body fossils are known, with isolated teeth being more common. They seem to have been a fairly successful group, however, ranging across what is now North America and Europe for about 100 million years from the early Carboniferous up until the massive Permian-Triassic extinction. The adult form of Delphiodontos is unknown, as the only fossil specimens are of aborted fetuses or recently born young. Sharp teeth and fecal matter in the fossils suggest that it practiced intrauterine cannibalism, like some modern sharks, such as sand tiger sharks. According to the fossils, the recently born would have resembled tadpoles with small, but sharp beaks. Because of the evidence suggesting intrauterine cannibalism, it is assumed to have been carnivorous, though, besides siblings, it is unknown what other organisms they would have eaten. The two best preserved specimens of the Upper Permian fish Monaspis have been reinvestigated, resulting in new interpretations of a variety of anatomical features. The conclusion is reached that the Monaspids cannot possibly be closely related to the Chimeriforms, nor to any of those better known bradiodonts with which they were previously classified. Although it emerged over 300 million years ago, Delta Tychius was similar in appearance to modern-day chimeras, possessing a long, whip-like tail and large, wing-like pectoral fins that it probably used to glide through the water. Its large eyes allowed it to hunt in deep waters, crushing shellfish between solid tooth plates in its mouth. Ineopteryx probably had a very similar, if not identical, lifestyle as chimeras today. As such Ineopteryx would have dwelled near the bottom, most probably in very deep water, hunting for crustaceans and invertebrates. Not only did Ineopteryx have a very robust-looking head, it had very specialized spines that rose up from the back of the head. It is uncertain what these spines were for but they would have been equally suited to both defense and display. It is these spines that superficially look like wings rising from the nape of the neck that gave its name. Many Samoriaforms are known for their unique tooth whorls, which are tightly packed groups of teeth arranged in a spiral or circular fashion. These tooth whorls are a distinctive feature of this group. They typically had elongated bodies and likely had a lifestyle similar to modern hagfish or lampreys. They were likely scavengers or predators. Cobalotus was an up to 2 meters long predator. Although it was related to the chimera, it had a number of differences from modern forms. 
Another unusual physical feature of Coba lotus are the 30 cm long, flexible cartilaginous tentacles sprouting from its pectoral fins. Their purpose is unknown. With a bulbous head, strongly arched back and dorsal fin that was so far back it sat near above the pelvic fins, it was not a shark that was built for speed. Instead it may have cruised around near the bottom hunting for crustaceans and other invertebrates that did not require active pursuit. Falcatus's most distinctive feature was the forward-pointing unicorn horn spine just behind its head, a sexually dimorphic structure formed from a highly modified dorsal fin, found only on mature males. The spine's function is unknown for certain, but it may have been a sort of clasper involved in courtship and mating, since one fossil seems to preserve a female in the act of biting onto it. Some of its close relatives like Stethacanthus also had similarly weird dorsal fins, so whatever these fish were actually doing with these structures it must have been a fairly successful strategy. Falcatus lived out in the open ocean, with proportionally big eyes giving it good vision in deep dark water, and its large symmetrical tail fin suggests it was a fast maneuverable swimmer that actively chased after small prey. Numerous fossils have been found together, which may also indicate schooling behavior. It is certain that Stethacanthus was a carnivore, and considering its small size probably fed on small fish, brachiopods, and crinoid ossicles like other sharks of its time. Additionally, as the spine brush complex is rather a large structure, it seems likely that, in combination with the forward-facing denticles on the structure, it would have produced a drag force during fast locomotion. Therefore, Stethacanthus was probably a slow-moving shark. Its fins were also smaller than in other sharks of the same size, and their teeth were also on the small side relative to other small Paleozoic sharks, suggesting that it may have been a bottom dweller. Considering that most of the specimens were recovered in the Bear Gulch limestone in Montana, it is possible that this area was not only a breeding ground for other sharks but also for Stethacanthus, suggesting that they were migratory. Cladus Lake is often hailed as the first true shark form to enter the fossil record, and although it has a number of features that are different to the sharks that we know today, you can still see a basic fusiform body plan. One thing that makes Cladus Lake stand out however is the lack of claspers. These are two fleshy projections that are present on the underside of modern sharks and serve the purpose of sperm transfer during reproduction. The exact method of reproduction used by Cladus Lake is still a matter of debate because no hard evidence exists to show us how it happened. Another thing that separates Cladus Lake from other sharks is the overall lack of scales, save for small areas around the mouth, eyes, and edges of the fins. Its mouth was not underslung like in today's sharks but instead more closely resembled the mouths of other fish. The jaw joint appears to have been quite weak, but was supported by powerful muscles, something that would have enabled Cladus Lake to tackle larger prey. Magribos Lake had a streamlined body with large pectoral fins, small pelvic fins and a strongly keeled crescent-shaped tail fin. And although it was superficially shark-like in appearance, it was actually part of a lineage known as Cladocelicids, which were much closer related to modern chimeras than to sharks. It's unclear if it had two dorsal fins like its close relative Cladus Lake, but some specimens preserve evidence of a chunky spine where the front dorsal fin would have been. It had a very broad snout with large and unusually widely spaced nostrils, which would have given it the ability to smell in stereo and determine the direction of scents carried through the water much more precisely, making it the earliest known example of that sort of sensory specialization. The eugeniodonts were a group of cartilaginous fish that convergently resembled sharks but were actually much closer related to modern chimeras. They had unique tooth whorls in their jaws, and the most famous member of the group is probably Helicoprian. Ornithoprian was one of the first one found with fossilized skull material, and helped with the early understanding of just how their weird jaw anatomy actually worked. At only around 50 centimeters long, 
it was one of the smaller of this group, and it also had a distinctive highly elongated chin. Similar to modern half-beak fish this structure may have served a sensory function, helping ornithoprion to detect prey in dark or murky waters. Living during the late Carboniferous, Edestus was a large fish, reaching estimated lengths of up to 6 meters, similar in size to a large white shark. It had a single central row of teeth in both its upper and lower jaws. Edestus whirls grew in curving banana-shaped brackets that resembled an enormous pair of pinking shears, with new teeth being added on at the back and the oldest teeth occasionally being ejected off from the front. How this jaw arrangement worked was a long-standing paleontological mystery, with various bizarre ideas being proposed over the years, until a particularly well-preserved skull was analyzed in early 2019, revealing a two-jointed system in its lower jaw that allowed it to move its tooth brackets quickly back and forth, using a snap and slice motion to grab hold of prey like fish and soft-bodied cephalopods and cut them in half. Helicoprion is one of the stranger sharks in the fossil record, although at the time that it swam the oceans there were actually many sharks that did not conform to the standard form that we know today. The majority of the remains of this shark are the teeth which are fossilized in a spiral pattern like the shell of an ammonite, in fact when first discovered these fossils were actually thought to be some kind of exotic ammonite shell. These arrangements of fossil teeth are today referred to as a tooth whirl. How and where the tooth whirl attached has been a source of puzzlement to paleoctheologists ever since it was realized what it was, and while the obvious choice might be to place the tooth whirl within the mouth, the whirl has on occasion been placed in different parts including the dorsal fin and even the tail. Today the whirl is almost always placed with the lower jaw, though for a long time not everyone agreed with the exact location. If the whirl was mounted on the tip it would significantly increase the drag that Helicoprion experienced as it swam through the water. Not only would it require more effort to swim, the greater water turbulence would have revealed the presence of Helicoprion to its potential prey. This is why many people now consider the whirl to have been further back into the mouth. How it used its whirl has also been another matter of debate with a variety of theories ranging from the whirl being used as a lash against fish, to a rasp that cut its way through the shells of ammonites with a sawing motion. Campyloprian teeth resemble those of Helicoprian, but the tooth whirl has an open spiral shape, more loosely coiled than that of Helicoprian. The size of its teeth indicate a length of up to 9 meters, which would make it one of the largest animals of the Carboniferous period. Paleontologists suggested that the whirl of these animals could have served as an effective mechanism for dehelling hard-shelled cephalopods such as ammonoids, which were abundant. If a hard-shelled cephalopod was bitten head-on, it was possible that the whirl could have served to pull the soft body out of the shell and into the mouth. During jaw closure, the palatoquadrates and tooth whirl combined to form a three-point system, equivalent to the setup of an inverted three-point flexural test. This system was effective at trapping and holding soft parts to increase cutting efficiency and provide leverage against hard-shelled prey. This large bite force may have allowed Campyloprion to expand its diet to vertebrates, as its jaw apparatus was more than capable of cutting through skeletal elements of unarmored bony fish and other chondrichthians. Echinochimera was an early member of the Chimera lineage, but unlike its mostly scaleless modern relatives its body was covered in small shark-like placoid scales. It also showed a large degree of sexual dimorphism, with males and females almost looking like different species entirely. Males are identified by the presence of claspers and were up to 15 cm long, with four pairs of spiny horns on their heads, larger more pointed dorsal fins, and rows of spines along their tails. Females were less than half the size of males at just 7 cm long, with only one pair of smaller horns and none of the additional spines. Metapacanthus is an extinct genus of cartilaginous fish from the early Jurassic epoch in Europe. It is known from the torsion of the Poseidonia shale of Germany. 
It is unusual due to being an extrange aberrant chimera, with a jaw-like structure over the skull. It had long thin spine with length of 33 centimeters. Squalaraja fossils are now known from the south coast of Europe. Around 30 centimeters long, this weird fish had a massive wide flat snout that looked like an even more extreme version of the long noses seen in some of its modern relatives, and this enormous snoot would have been absolutely packed with sensory receptors to help it locate small aquatic prey hidden in the muddy seafloor. Some specimens also have a distinctive long horn-like spine on their foreheads, and since these individuals also have claspers, it seems like this was a sexually dimorphic feature. Much like the smaller head claspers on modern chimeras, male squalaraja probably used this horn to hang on to females' pectoral fins during mating, and with it being such a large elaborate structure it may also have been used for visual display purposes, too. Chimeras are soft-bodied, shark-like fish with bulky heads and long, tapered tails, measured from the tail, they can grow up to 150 centimeters in length. Like other members of the class Chondrichthyes, chimera skeletons are entirely cartilaginous, or composed of cartilage. Their skin is smooth and relatively free of scales or unique features, lacking the keeled, tooth-like placoid scales present on sharks and rays. Chimeras live in temperate ocean floors down to 2,600 meters deep, with few occurring at depths shallower than 200 meters the usual diet of chimeras consist of crustaceans, and more specifically, they include ophiurans and mollusks. Modern species are demersal durophages, but they used to be more diverse. The Carboniferous period had forms that lived as specialized suction feeders in the water column. Australian ghost shark is silvery in color with iridescent reflections and dark, variable markings on the sides. It has an elongated body, which is smooth and torpedo-shaped, with two widely separated, triangular dorsal fins. They use their hoe-shaped snouts to probe the ocean bottom for invertebrates and small fishes. This fish has three cone pigments for color vision, like primates. Its dorsal fin has a very sharp spine. The spine has been reputed to be venomous, but no serious injuries have yet been reported. In South Australia, they are caught by some recreational fishers in inshore waters during autumn and winter, typically from surf beaches or sheltered beaches. Like some sharks, spotted ratfish are oviparous. Their spawning season peaks during the spring to autumn. During this time, the female releases up to two fertilized eggs into sand or mud areas of the seabed every 10 to 14 days. The egg sac is leather-like and has a filament connected to it which is used to attach it to the ocean floor when it is let go by the mother. Male have multiple secondary sexual characteristics, which include paired pelvic claspers, a single frontal tentaculum, and paired pelvic tentacula. The pelvic claspers are located on the ventral side of the fish. They protrude out from the pelvic fins and are responsible for the movement of sperm to the oviduct of the female. The interior of the pelvic clasper is supported by cartilage and separates into two branches, ultimately ending in a fleshy lobe on the posterior end. The cephalic clasper is a unique, club-like organ not found in any other vertebrate. The cephalic clasper is located on the head of the fish, just anterior to the eyes. The ratfish prefers to maintain a safe distance from divers, and are usually not aggressive. However, if they feel their territory has been invaded, they are able to inflict a mildly toxic wound with their dorsal fin spines. As they swim, they perform barrel rolls and corkscrew turns, as if they are flying. Ratfish swim using large pectoral fins, and this has often been termed aquatic flight given the resemblance to a bird. Silver Chimera got its name for the string patterns on the surface of its body, like a monster sewed up by different animal parts, referring to a Greek mythic creature named Chimera, which combined lion with the snake and goat. One of the fascinating features of Silver Chimera is its teeth. Teeth are actually the skin derivatives, not just refer to hard stuff inside the mouth. As for Chimera fish, 
the male fish has three kinds of teeth, which grow by different organs respectively. It is classified as a benthophagous species. This means that its main diet comprises bottom-feeding invertebrates. Larger individuals had a narrow diet spectrum, consuming mainly decapods. Conditioned by predator size group, significant differences in diet were observed between geographical areas and depths. This suggests that despite some degree of prey specialization according to predator size, this deepwater species can change its diet in accordance with the food-restricted environment that characterizes its habitat.